sets of papers here for tonight, but you can look on with each other, and I'll fill in the blanks uh, as and when I can. I was figuring on 14 at the most, so I made 14 sets. Also, in our next session, we're going to be dealing with the library, the minister's library. I'm not going to go through this book. This is for you. Five bucks a piece. Cost me more than that. And uh, if we need any more, I have a few more upstairs in the, in the locked down book closet. But we're going to be going through a library. I want to survey everything. We'll pray and then I'll introduce the class basically what we'll try to accomplish. Do you all have the uh, schedule and lesson plan? Or you have someone to share it with? And uh, I'll deal with that. And then an introduction to homiletics. We'll deal with that. Then we'll look to the readings that you should have done before this class. I didn't make it uh, clear, I suppose, but these readings from Broadus and from Lloyd-Jones uh, should be done, or Spurgeon, whoever we have for the reading, should be done by the time you come to class, and we'll discuss those. You'll find that uh, some of these things are rather subjective, but God makes preachers, and he's never made two of them exactly alike. Fundamentalists are quite a bit alike, but that's because they're rubber stamped. But God's not in the rubber stamping business. So we'll pray. And we'll get acquainted, and we trust God will uh, visit us tonight in his blessing. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that we might have a consciousness of your presence. We pray that you would sanctify the time we spend. You would sanctify our conversations and discussions. We pray that we might learn, and what knowledge we have might be put to practical use in your kingdom, and for your glory. Guide us, we pray. Make this a worthwhile class in every way, and more so by your grace, we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm Pastor Downing, and I will be the teacher, and I have my associate here, Dr. Nelson, and you have Pastor Joe. They're the two lungers in the back with lung problems and pneumonia and blood clots and so forth, and uh, yet we're all here. I still have two students that aren't here tonight, and uh, hopefully they haven't had car trouble. They come about an hour and 15 minutes or so to get here. Maybe they'll show up. I hope so. Uh, what I want to do is introduce the class. Everyone is here. Hola, brethren. Uh, I'll introduce the class. I won't deal with all of this paper that we have, but I'll introduce the class, basically what we have, what we'll accomplish, what is uh, required for the class. I do lecture at times, but these will not be lectures as much as they will be discussions. And we'll discuss various things, and if you want to ask a question or make a point, why well, raise your hand so all things will be done decently and in order. Sometimes I'll ask questions, especially concerning the readings. We have three textbooks, if you want to look on that first page, under textbooks. We have three textbooks, one by John Broadus, The Preparation and Delivery of Sermons. This is the sixth, I have the sixth edition of Broadus here in, in paperback. The common edition of Broadus is edited by Weatherspoon, who was his son-in-law, and Weatherspoon was an Arminian. I do not recommend that book. It's entirely different than Broadus's book, and it's the one that is popular today in most Bible colleges and seminaries, and it takes an entirely different philosophy toward preaching. And uh, he will say, not that preaching is to be directed toward the mind, but preaching is to be directed toward the will. And he's very strong on it because he believed in free will. And everything then to adjust to that is put on a subjective emotional basis for preaching. So that the tendency was away. Broadus began this book and these series of lectures immediately after the war between the states. They had two professors. Professors. 
The Southern Baptist Seminary started all over again from scratch. They had uh, the professor of theology, uh, Boyce, J.P. Boyce. He taught about everything there was to teach, and he shared that with John Broadus. When John Broadus had his first homiletics class, does anybody know the story? I'm a storyteller here. He had one blind man as a student. That's how he started after the war. One blind man as a student. This that I have is the sixth edition. <clears throat> By that time, he had a fairly good-sized class. It is entitled, The Preparation and Delivery of Sermons, and that's exactly what it is. The first one written by Baptist, he doesn't deal with the pastor's call. He doesn't deal with the work of the Holy Spirit in the life and consciousness of the pastor. These things are, are extremely important. He doesn't deal with these things. He deals essentially with the preparation and delivery of sermons. So uh, as much as I like Broadus, we needed to supplement him. And so the next book is Lloyd-Jones, Preaching and Preachers. How many of you have read it? I mean, you've had it before, you've had time to read it. It's an excellent work. And he deals very much with the Holy Spirit in the pastor's life, the Holy Spirit in preaching, the spiritual side of things. And you have to understand that Lloyd-Jones was a medical doctor. He was not a doctor of theology, and uh, he was, can I say this, self-taught as a preacher. He, he could have been physician to the queen. He was educated in one of the best hospitals in Britain, and he resigned everything and took a small uh, Welsh church uh, in Wales. In one of their revivals in that small church, he had 135 additions in one year. I think he saw in his early ministry two times of revival, and it marked his life. Uh, in uh, 1943, he went to be the assistant, associate, and then took over from G. Campbell Morgan at uh, Westminster Chapel in London. And he was there until, what, 1963 or 1968. He developed, it doesn't say this, but he developed colon cancer, and he had to wear a, a he had a colonoscopy, and so he had to wear a bag on his hip until he died in 1981. So he traveled, he preached, he wrote, and so forth. You're going to find him to be a very determined man, uh, very opinionated, self-taught, but an extraordinary man. And if you've seen him on videos or old films, or you've heard his lectures, a tremendous mind. Probably one of the greatest preachers, if not the greatest preacher of the 20th century. G. Campbell Morgan was not the man that, uh, that Martin Lloyd-Jones was. My theology professor, Peter Conley, went to Westminster Chapel in 1926. He was an evangelist preaching in the time of the Fisher Folk Revival. The revival was over. He was getting ready to go to Africa as a missionary. And he visited on a Sunday morning and heard G. Campbell Morgan preach. He said, I have never in my life witnessed such power and magnetism in an individual to, to have the people in his hand. And of course, you've seen a picture of G. Campbell Morgan. He's skinny. Uh, he smokes cigars. You look at him and said, I wonder if he had any lung power. But my theology professor said, never in his life. He said he just transfixed him. Then he found after the sermon that he was mad in the pulpit. It, it lost He was mad because he charged fees to get in to hear himself preach. And that's how he made his living in his later life. He was a pastor there twice. But he said that he's never heard anything like G. Campbell Morgan at his best. And of course, I didn't have that privilege. I'm a little too young for that by a few years. But I've heard Lloyd-Jones, at least on tape, and, uh, and I've seen him on some old films, and I've watched him, and uh, not flashy, and not the best grammar. And I'm a stickler for grammar. I have a degree in English, by the way, brethren. <laughs> but all you have to do is write a sermon in this class. That, that's the big project, and I'll, 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 I'll grade your grammar and check it, your punctuation and so forth.
Just remember, I am proofing our book on early church history right, right now, and I have three proofreaders who have butchered me on every page for 368 pages, so I'm humbled tonight. I want you to know that. But uh, writing a book is not a humbling experience, it's a humiliating experience, if you've ever attempted to do so. But uh, at any rate, uh, he'll say, have got, instead of gotten. And, uh, but there was power in his preaching, and he could speak. And he's not a refined preacher, and he speaks against refined preaching. Uh, if you've read the assignment and had your book, pages 9 through 44, uh, you'll see that uh, it, preaching is sort of rough-hewn because it's a man with passion, conviction, divine authority, preaching to another individual. It's communication. And sometimes polishedness destroys the communication. So his view of preaching is very refreshing and uh, doesn't quote much Latin. Spurgeon's always quoting Latin, and Lloyd-Jones didn't care for that. But then who can criticize Spurgeon? So Lloyd-Jones balances this out very much, and I think they make good companions. The third one is Spurgeon's Lectures to My Students. Now, this was our textbook for pastoral theology last semester. So some of these things deal with the spiritual aspects. Some of them deal more with the preaching aspects, and they're all really intertwined. You cannot separate pastoral theology from homiletics, the, the, the preparation and delivery of sermons. One uh, devolves out of the other. And if you divorce them, then you've lost an element of life and intimacy. We're going to do the best we can. We'll be discussing the readings. I've outlined uh, these uh, chapters and so forth. I have little notations here and there. We'll discuss. I'll ask you questions. I'll ask your opinion. We'll discuss. We'll see where one man will emphasize one thing and another man will emphasize something else. And very seldom will we have all three uh, uh, readings in all three textbooks. We'll have a reading here, a reading there, uh, maybe two at the most, because they all carry uh, and cover different aspects. Now, dates and lectures. January the 27th, you're all here for that. The importance and primacy of preaching. And we're going to discuss this tonight from the books and from other material that I have. And then our next class will be February the 10th, the necessity and use of one's personal library as a resource. All I will say at this point, you need this book. I'm not here to sell books. My, I've written 18 books so far. Do you know what I get for writing a book? A free copy. Everything goes to the church, but you'll need one of these to look it over. And if you're not building a library, you can take some hints from that. Also from books, the purchase of books, the use of books, how to build a library, and then certain things you want for certain occasions. What does the preacher do late at Sunday night when he goes home? I have a good friend that watches some charismatic so we can stir his spirit again. <laughs> he, he's ready to preach after watching, uh, oh, I forget what the fellow's name was. I said, you do that? Well, sometimes I have a stack of books at home. I have a whole library at home. When I go home for lunch or so, I'm going through books and making notes. In the evening, if possible, or when I'm sick, uh, have some time, when uh, I'm just not up to it, a biography. I finished this last year, 1,600 pages, two volumes by E.A. Johnson on George Whitfield, a definitive biography. It's unlike anything I've ever read. If you've read Arnold Dallimore, read him first. And when you've mastered Dallimore, go on to E.A. Johnson. E.A. Johnson has material that wasn't available. Dallimore was a personal friend of mine. Uh, and he died years ago. Very, very short man, tremendous preacher. Wow. And uh, his heart and soul is in that. I was lecturing at a, at a conference and they shut me down because I was trying to preach my lecture rather than with all of our British friends, read it word for word. And they, my time was up, they cut me off. I didn't finish my lecture. But it was in print anyway. 
So he walked in two hours later and he looked up at me. He was about 5'2", maybe 5'3", and he said, I heard they cut you off this morning. And you could hear him all over the dining hall, what we need is preaching. <laughs> and oh yeah, he was a fiery preacher. Well, that's what we need, preaching. And I can't think of uh, anything worse than reading a sermon. Our people wouldn't uh, put up with that, would they? Maybe a man's first occasion trying to preach. He might stay close to his notes. In my old age, I do, but we need preaching. There's something in that communication. There's something living and vital that passes between the preacher and the hearer. And we say much here in our church in our early morning prayer meeting on uh, the Lord's Day morning. We pray for an atmosphere for preaching. And that you have to have. You have to have an atmosphere for preaching. It takes an atmosphere. <coughs> I, I, I'll tell a short story. In 1981, I was called to be the speaker at Family Radio Spring Conference in San Diego. Great big church, seat, seat 2,000 people. And they had an entertainment time. But the station manager's name was Holt, died of brain cancer a couple of years later, very good friend of mine. He said, you know, we play one of your sermons every Saturday night. We call it our Saturday night special. I said, Brother Holt, that's a cheap shot <laughs> because that's a you know, really inexpensive handgun as a Saturday night special. And he had a tremendous sense of humor. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, hold their feet to the fire. So I preached on the ethic of the gospel. And when I got up to preach, the, the platform was larger than this room and it was white marble. And they put the spotlight on me and I thought, this is not going to go over well. And I said, I'm not here tonight to entertain you. And 500 people got up and walked out. The next year, they had Al Martin. So I took him to the meeting. I said, this is what they did to me last year, but we're using this church's facility and we have to put up with what we have. And he sat right on the front row ahead of me and I was here, my wife was here, his wife was here. We had Cookie, Mickey, Dixie, and everybody else whose name ended in I or IE. I think all the preacher's wives were there. And all the lights went off after the song service, rousing entertainment, and uh, everybody was <laughs> enthused and so forth. And the lights went out and the spotlight honed in to the corner and out came this man with a big fake beard and a wig and dressed in gunny sacks saying, Martha, Martha, you're cumbered with much serving. And the drama department of the church put on this program. Al Martin glowed in the dark. The red came up his neck, it came out his ears, his head went down, and I thought, oh, I said, this is it. When he got up in the pulpit, it took him about 15 minutes to, to taxi around and get off the runway, and, and, and he had to, and you'll find this, this is part of preaching, so I'm just not telling stories. You will find occasions, sometimes much of the time, if you go to you know, a place where you're not familiar, people are not familiar with you, you'll have to create your own atmosphere for preaching. And that's difficult. You don't do it by telling jokes because they've already lost. I was in a meeting eh, in this area. We had Pharaoh Griswold to preach. He got up, a new congregation. He didn't know the people. I knew them. And he said, he read his text out of 1 John he said the atonement was a legal transaction between the Father and the Son, and that killed that meeting. They're all dispensationalists. It just killed that meeting. And he preached around for a long time until he finally got the people together and got a real atmosphere for preaching. And afterwards I said, do you know what was wrong? He said, no. I said, they're all dispensationalists. He said, that makes sense. And there it is. So th there's strange things that, uh, that happen. You don't want to go into a meeting where you have to create your own atmosphere for preaching. If the people are prepared, good hymns are sung, the, the, you, your soul is liberated. You, you're aware of power and of freedom. And uh, the difference between public speaking and preaching, just a thought. Have you ever gone to a Kiwanis Club meeting or maybe who knows what. You ever seen the speaker for the day in the restroom or out in the parking lot walking back and forth saying, oh God, help me. I don't know what to do. No, he's there contained within his own personality. He's got his jokes. He has his 
personal charisma. He has all of these things, and he must broadcast himself and advertise himself to the people, and that's what he is, and you'll get nothing more than that. But there's no preacher that goes into the pulpit believing for a moment that he's self-sufficient. If he does, it's going to be a bad day. Amen. And, and you go thinking, I can't do this. What in the world am I doing here? And you wish you were sitting in the back of the auditorium, mm-hmm. hiding behind the back pew and somebody else are up there preaching. And God does that to us. He humbles us that we depend upon him. Once you get into the message, by the grace of God, oh, then you're able to preach, then everything begins to come together. That's we trust is the unction and work of the Spirit of God enabling you to do what within your own personality you could not do. These three textbooks will cover most of these aspects. And what Broadus will miss, because of his limitations, good where he's good, these other two men will take, will take up for us. Now, so we'll deal with libraries, though, because you not only educate yourself. You can go to the best schools in the world. Go to the best theological seminary there is. Take your Greek, your Hebrew, your philosophy, theology, church history, and all of these other things, hermeneutics, homiletics, apologetics, and so forth. You still will not be an educated person. All education is self-education and self-taught. You have to apply yourselves. That is how we get an education. You have to schedule your own readings. Master the subject here. Get this aspect of a subject there. Get a handle on it. And God will bring this out in your preaching. At unexpected times, your mind will take a turn. You'll be preaching on something. You'll open up a passage, maybe an extended passage of Scripture. I was with a bunch of Mormons one night on an elk hunting trip in uh, Montana. I was, I was invited to go because I paid most of the money. And I cooked for the men at the elk camp, and we hunted, and we met all these Mormons up there. Uh, they, they own most of Montana as well as Idaho and Utah. And the man said, understand, you're a Baptist preacher. I said, well, I have an ordination certificate that says I am. He says, well, quote me a verse of scripture. I quoted Romans chapter 8 for him. He says, I, I, I guess you're right. And there's a little preaching involved in that too. But you, you don't know. There will be things that will come into your personality that will come out maybe years later. A story, an anecdote, a fact, something in history. It'll come out, and you'll think, my, where did that come from? But it fits. And if you don't have anything in here, God's not going to give you an immediate inspiration. Mm -hmm. So, well-educated in all of these subjects. I I knew a man. I followed him by one man in in a certain church in this area. And I asked him, I said, you know, you're, you're you're a seminary graduate, but you've done a lot of studying on your own. He said, two days a week, I devote a half an hour for each subject. And he would study... Uh, exegetical theology, biblical theology, historical theology, systematic theology, practical theology, and then he would take this commentary and that commentary. He'd devote a few minutes a day to each one of these so he could always reach out and learn. The problem was he was still pretty much of an Arminian and dispensationalist. I never did figure that out. But he was making an attempt because the seminary only gave him a basis a foundation. It gave him study habits, but it doesn't educate you, you see. Nothing can really educate you in that way. It's a self-process. And there are certain times you want to read biographies. You want to read George Mueller uh, by uh, Oh my. Steer. Roger Steer. I'll go back farther than that. Uh, A.T. Pearson. I have a first edition, by the way, and in the back it was a five-point countenance to give all of his doctrinal convictions and how he came to them. You don't get that in the new one, by the way. That, when I'm sick, and I've not so far this year, but I usually the tail end before I get sick here every few years, that's the book I take. And I also take a couple of other choice missionary books. And the best I can, I read them and I go through them. I weep, I bawl, I repent. My soul is revived. 
And if I'm out of the pulpit a week or two, then I'm ready to get back in again. But I don't have time to read those on an everyday basis. I'm dealing with all of these other things. You need to feed your own soul. So a library is just not getting a bunch of books and you must study well beyond your sermon preparation. The average preacher might preach twice, three times a week, maybe four, if he's young and energetic. If all you do is study for your preaching, you're always taking away, you're not adding to. You always have less and less. You hear a man preach, you go to a meeting, you hear a man preach, you say, wow, that, that's substantial. You go to a meeting five years later, he preaches the same sermon, he hasn't grown at all. It hasn't changed, it's the same thing. And you say, my. Then if you live long enough, you go to hear him a few years later, and it's the same thing. He's got a stack of sermons and he just repeats them, but he doesn't grow. And he doesn't grow spiritually. Your library should help you grow spiritually. There should be works in there that will do something to you. I'll ask you a question. How many of you have ever heard or read or know of the book, The Sympathy of Christ by Octavius Winslow? Have you ever read a book like that? I never in my life, a lady in our church said, I want something that's really spiritual, Pastor. I said, I have an extra copy, I'll give it to you. She said, I'll never ask you again. That is the most awesome book I've ever read. The Sympathy of Christ is this, Octavius Winslow, one of the great spiritual writers of the, of the uh, 19th century. He studies the life of Christ. He takes every human emotion of Christ and believe that our Lord in his human nature raised it to its highest potential. The tears of Christ, the sighs of Christ, the anger of Christ, all of this devotes whole chapters to it and you are just swimming in an ocean so far over your head, you'll never touch the bottom. It's good sometimes to have your mind challenged spiritually as well as academically, but we must go on. I'm taking, so we'll discuss this. You can check off a few books. There are some things and I'll, I'll talk to you how I would build and how I have built a library over the years and every once in a while clean a lot of it out and put other books in because I've outgrown some of the books. Then there's some books, of course, you never outgrow. Uh, February the 24th, The Spiritual Nature of Preaching, and of course it would be Lloyd-Jones and Spurgeon. And every other Tuesday night all the way through May 19th, the final paper will be a written sermon. You'll have this on page two a written sermon with a justification of the subject and text. In other words, how did I arrive at the subject and the text, and then headings and subheadings with explanations of the various divisions and an exposition of material. It doesn't have to be a word-for-word -word sermon, but it should be substantial that you can justify and say, this is what I would get up in the pulpit with, and anyone can look at those notes and follow you right on through. We're going to spend one lecture on just opening the text. That is an appendix at the back of this book. It's an article I wrote entitled, Opening the Text. Who was the first expository preacher? Paul. Stephen. Moses. Jesus. Jesus. Again? Moses. Moses. He gave an exposition of the Ten Commandments in Exodus in Deuteronomy. Gentlemen, he was the first writer of scripture and he was the first expository preacher. I'll explain it in there. Just something to think about. Always open the text. Your people will learn something. They'll be taught. Much teaching in preaching. And today sometimes there's not much teaching at all. All right. What follows here is just the syllabus from our catalog. And I deal with preaching as the primary work of the preacher and pastor. And we deal with the vital importance of spiritual preparation as well. I, uh, I know there are some men that must alliterate sermons. And I picked up a man from the airport once. I administered a small college. And the, pre the president of another college was coming to preach this meeting. And he was doing it for the president of our college, who's also the pastor of our church. And how preachers go with the mechanics of preaching. And these are the old southern boys. And they said, you know, he said, I can't find an alliterated outline for this and so on and so forth. And I'm driving them back from the airport trying to mind my own business. I was, what, 29, 30 years of age then. I was the go-to guy and the go-for guy. And uh, 
Now he said, uh, he said, what outline would you have for this? Uh, the man that had the tree, it hasn't brought forth fruit. So he told his servants, you dig around it and dung it. And we'll wait next year. If it doesn't bring forth fruit, we'll cut it down. He said, I'm going to preach on that. He says, can you, can you give me an outline on it? I said, I can. It's alliterated. I said, dig it, dung it, and delay it. And he wrote that down. I was having fun. My, is that what it takes? I know a man. I, I respect him highly. He is a well-seasoned pastor. He cannot preach a sermon unless it's alliterated. And I used to have to alliterate all that. So I have some good alliterations. I don't think they're too far off the track, but I'd rather have just substance. Substance. And sometimes we just make observations on a passage of Scripture. One of the best and most enjoyable times is lessons from the life of and then open up an Old Testament character. The more you get into it, the more it just opens up and the more relevant it becomes. And there's always a gospel application. But become your own man. You will find out that Lloyd-Jones was an expository preacher because he usually preached through books of the Bible. He preached series. He preached series through books of the Bible. Spurgeon was a topical preacher. Only a few times in his life did he ever preach a message and then preach the second in a series. Only a few times he ever did that. And he was basically a, a, a topical preacher. He would take a text, and if it was a short text, he would look at it one way, then look at it another way, and then look at it another way. But he had a photographic memory. And uh, he would read at least six difficult books a week to keep his mind sharp. And he had this plethora of material that just gushed and, and demanded his attention. So when he got into the pulpit with that six by nine uh, inch outline, have you ever seen an outline of Spurgeon? Some of my friends have them in purple ink. You know, the originals they have framed on their wall. I've not been able to talk them out of one. And they're all gonna live much longer than I am. But purple ink because it was the business of the king. And he would have major points and sub points but all of this material in his mind rushed in to, to, to fill up that was there. It's always rich. The head of the London Bible Society would have dinner with him once a month. And they were in, and they both received this book to critique. And the man said, well, you know, I think thus and such and thus and such. And Spurgeon said, I think you're wrong. I think you misunderstood the man. Went over and put the book off his shelf, opened it up, gave it to the man, and sat there and quoted about six pages out of it word for word. The news, brethren, that's not good is that most of us struggle to have a few thoughts. We're not like that. Calvin had a photographic memory. Luther had a photographic memory. Spurgeon had a photographic memory. I have a photographic memory. Half my thoughts are negative, and that's as close as I get to this. But, but the, these, men, these men would have been great whatever they did, and, and yet all of them were different. Calvin was thrown out of Geneva. And so he stopped preaching. He was preaching through the Bible. Stopped. Went to Strasbourg. Married Idolette. Stayed there. They brought him back to Geneva because the Catholics were trying to take over the city again. And when he got in the pulpit of Geneva, what did he do? He preached on the next verse. After about three years, he started the next verse that he had left off with when he left there before. And, uh, and most of this found its way into his commentaries. And there's, there's life in Calvin's commentaries, except when he's fighting the Church of Rome and things like that. That sort of dates him. But other than that, he could have preached it yesterday or today. There's a relevance there. And that's, uh, that, that's an amazing thing. Well, at age 22, Scaliger, the historian, said that Calvin was the most educated man in Europe. At age 22, and that was the year he came out for the Reformation and made his conversion known. Okay, uh, I have a bibliography. Of course, we'll deal with that next week. Just a few things here and there uh, on pastoral theology and homiletics. We'll look at that next week because there are some things there that are pretty, pretty awesome. I've read all of the books that are mentioned there and uh, at one time had them in my library. Uh, as, a, as administrator of the school, I bought all the books that came over and 
more or less skimmed through them and evaluated them. Now, introduction to homiletics, the second paper. And you'll find out that every uh, other page is upside down because my printer and I have some disagreements. Uh. <laughs> and uh, I want you to know I was almost through proofing my book today when Microsoft went belly up and quit and I lost everything I had done by way of editing the book of that version of it, because I always make a new version, but I lost four hours today. I have to recuperate, I have to recoup that uh, tomorrow. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm schizophrenic, I'm going from micro, uh, Microsoft to Apple, and uh, one of my friends reminded me that all of our problems started with an Apple, but to me this is, uh, this is a great step forward. Only, only, Eve was the first one who had an apple. I suppose that Adam was a PC man, but we'll let that go. Introduction to homiletics. I promised Pastor Joe that I would try to keep my humor in check. This uh, section is from my book, A Theological Propodeutic. Do any of you have that book? Our students do. 640 pages long, a propodeutic is, that's a Greek word, it's an encyclopedic introduction to the study of something. This gives an introduction to every area of theology, something they do not teach in American seminaries and we're poorer for it. They do it in Europe, they should do it here. It, 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 it provides a key that everything assumes its proper place in one's thinking. So I have some thoughts here and the first is, the New Testament pattern and expository ministry. I find it very strange that people argue about uh, subject sermons, you know, topical sermons. You get a subject, you find a text someplace that goes with it. And if not, you find a text that comes close. Uh, I'm not going to mention somebody who preaches in London, one of the foremost preachers in the world, but I saw him do this one night at a fundamentalist meeting, and I thought, his text has nothing to do with the sermon. But at any rate, I'll let that go. He's a, he's a dear and good friend. But at any rate, and I, I won't be too, well, this is my class, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's an object. We, we practice here a close communion for whatever that's for in, in our church. And somebody says, why, 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 how can you just have the Lord's Supper for members of your local congregation? Where do you get such an idea? I said, what does the New Testament teach and what's the practice in the New Testament? <clears throat> I said, I didn't get my theology from Schofield's notes. <laughs> I had to study everything myself. I was in Bible school for about six weeks and said, this is not the direction I need to go. This is not the direction I want to go. I knew immediately, I had an interlinear, Greek interlinear. I knew immediately that I needed the languages and I need to open the text. And in fundamentalism, and I went to a fundamentalist school at the very first, they don't open the text, number one. Number two, from my experience of being amongst them for many years, they can't open the text. They are walking like the Spaniards did in California over gold deposits they don't even know are there. Mm. But once you start, a very familiar passage of Scripture, very simple passage of Scripture, there's something there that's, that does not come across. And sometimes it opens the text up so beautifully and, and half your work is done. If you can explain it to the people in language they understand and you can make the text live to them, maybe they fall asleep after that and sleep through your whole sermon, but they've learned something. They've been taught. That text will never be the same in their thinking. I have a, a Jewish lady that I visit at the rest home, and I was taking uh, one of our men with me for the first time. I said, now, understand when I come up, the, the curtain's there, you know, to be sure that she's clothed and have her covers up, and so she's suffering from a terrible disease, and I said, I'm going to bark, and she's going to answer. And he looks at me like, my poor pastor has lost his mind. So I went up and I went, roof, roof. She says, oh, Reverend, come right on in. She says, wait till I get my covers pulled up. So we walked in and we talked to her. I says, you see, she's Jewish. And she would always say, 
give me something from the Old Testament. And so I would give them the Shema usually. Several Jewish people, the Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. He says, oh, you sound better than my rabbi. <laughs> but we have a good time with him. And she says, give me something from the Old Testament. I said, what about Psalm 23? And I've preached on this many times at funerals. Once in Chicago, and uh, I had a business friend in Chicago who was a bookkeeper from some very questionable people who had landfills in <coughs> Chicago. Hopefully not too many bodies in them. And, uh, but he was Dutch, and I preached his funeral. And a lot of very uh, high society people were there, including this little Dutch a little uh, a Jewish lady with all of her jewelry on and her, and it was in the winter time and it was cold and she had all her furs and everything on and I spoke on Psalm 23. She says, I need to talk to you. She says, I'm Jewish. I said, I would have never guessed. <laughs> of course, I was kidding. She said, all my life, faithful in the synagogue, I've never understood Psalm 23 until today. And uh, I'll put it out as an example maybe of expository preaching, an outline on it or so. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's God's two sheep dogs. Mm -hmm. What does the Hebrew read? They shall dog my steps. And what's the Greek? Septuagint, dioko. Deacon, pursue. They shall pursue me all the days of my life. The shepherd's coming back to the sheepfold. He's got his two sheepdogs with him. Goodness and mercy. So I always bark at her when I go in. She knows who it is. You know, God's two sheepdogs. She's never forgotten it. It opens up because that's the, that's the figure that is used throughout there. The shepherd and the sheep. Morning in the meadows. Midday on the mountain. The evening and its evils. The sheepfold and its safety. And it's all there in the Hebrew text. How many sermons did we have on that? In, in our rather bleak days here some years ago, I think I preached 28 messages on Psalm 23, just, just, just sort of putting lotion on the wounds and, and just rejoicing in the word of God. And in the Hebrew text, it just, it, it's awesome, much more than it is in the English, but goodness and mercy are God's two sheepdogs. And uh, I've, had to, uh, I've had to think about that quite a bit. I'll try not to go astray too much. Do any of you speak in tongues when you pray? I do. We have any good Greek scholars here? Praying for my grandchildren. Do not save them at, but save them upon a life of sin. Don't save them out of ek, a life of sin, but save them away from apa, a life of sin. I found out it expresses itself in the Greek better than uh, in the English. And I, I think about that. We've been through some terrible things in, in my family over the years. And I've learned to pray for a lot of things I necessarily did not know to pray for years ago. But I pray, and I pray especially for my grandchildren and the world they're growing up in. And I find the Greek sometimes helps me with its prepositions more than the English does. So that I was a little humor to keep you awake. Here we are. This is from our propodeutic. This is Paul. What does the New Testament teach? Have you ever tried to homiletically get Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost? I think he would have flunked homiletics class. But it was inspired. Do you know why I say that? Well, of course it's inspired. Why I say he would have probably flunked homiletics class? It doesn't fit a homiletical mold. But it was given in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So remember, don't depend on your homiletics. Depend on the unction of the Spirit of God. Just something to think about. Now, Acts 17, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So what do you find? You find an aorist verb, dialexita, the aorist verb, which means to thoroughly expose, to give an exposition of, of the scriptures. And then we have the words opening and alleging. Opening here, there are two present participles that modify the aorist verb, opening and alleging. He opened the very text of scripture. He's in the synagogue. He's going to open either the Hebrew text or the Septuagint. 
Jews of the Diaspora were probably more at home in the Septuagint. But at any rate, he would open the text and then he would put forth his proofs and his reasons. He was an expository preacher. That was his custom in the synagogues. Now we find him at Mars Hill before the Areopagus, the Council of Twelve, in a much different situation. They had no background in Scripture. He never quoted Scripture, but every statement he made was grounded solidly in the Word of God. That point needs to be made. So this is something to think about. The New Testament in its preaching usually has an expository foundation and basis. We don't, find it, we don't seem to find just a subject sermon, a topic where we go hither and yon and try to develop a topic. It's usually an exposition of Scripture. Of course, our Lord's ministry to the Jews, the apostles' ministry to the Jews, they had their roots in the Old Testament, and so it was bound to be more expository in nature. Among the Gentiles, perhaps not as much. But most of Paul's converts came from where? They came from proselytes in the Jewish synagogue. So he was usually dealing, most of his ministry, with those who had some background in the Word of God. The New Testament pattern, a doctrinal ministry. 2 Timothy 1.13, hold fast the form of sound words. And the word form, which is footnote 2, hupatuposin, means a pattern, a form, an outline, a sketch, a summary. There was this summary of doctrine that came out in the preaching. Don't we have this in gospel preaching? We have the righteousness of God. We have the sinfulness of man. We have the perfect righteousness of Christ provided in his active and passive obedience. We have the necessity to repent and believe. We have, in a sense, whatever we preach on, if it's true gospel preaching, we have certain essential things, an outline, a sketch, a summary of truth that is to come out in the completeness of gospel preaching. We had it in the New Testament. We're going to finally get to homiletics before our class is over tonight. <laughs> the New Testament pattern of faithful ministry and the two, uh, three, four passages here of 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Uh, and I, I will just summarize this for you. When you look at the key passages in the New Testament of the qualifications for a pastor, the emphasis is not on his gifts and abilities. The emphasis is on his moral character. In a nutshell, that's what we want to see. And I say this, Pastor Joe, how many years have you been in the ministry? 31. 31. Pastor Paul was ordained here 10 years ago. Amongst all of us, I've been 51 years and a half now in the ministry. We, we have a lot of years amongst us. I have seen men that if I didn't know who they were, they could make me weep when they preached. They could stir my heart. But I've seen some of them, known them to be immoral. I've seen some of them when I know that they're a living contradiction of what they are on the pulpit. And when the church calls a man to be their pastor, uh, they say, uh, well, you know, uh, I had this experience, so I'll tell you something very short. I sat before the men and women. I don't like that. I think the men ought to be the heads of the situation, talk to the men of the church, the heads of the families and the men of the church. But in this case, it was a fundamentalist church. The women ran the church. So any questions now? And they, were, they had considered calling me as pastor. Wow. The women gave me the third degree. How many hours do you spend in prayer a day? How do you treat your wife? And I didn't have, we didn't have any children at the time, and they gave me the, they asked good questions, practical questions. And it was fairly frustrating for me because all the men sat there with a blank look on their face, and I'm thinking, this is not going over too well. Do any of the men have a question? One man has a question. This actually happened, by the way. I'm not just telling stories. I'm telling true stories. And I said, what's your question? He said, in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God, were they angels or men? <laughs> and I said, well, I will tell you. The angel theory came out of the Alexandrian text of the Septuagint. <laughs> 
which meant nothing to him because he was a fundamentalist and didn't know beans. And that's where it came from. I'm not an angel theory man. But I said, what does that have to do with my becoming the pastor of this church? I said, you just wanted to know it, didn't you? He says, yeah. My. <laughs> they had no other questions. I take that as a real failure. I think if we were going to call a pastor and I were going to be in the congregation, that I would go through some of these passages and uh, I would try to ask the best questions I could. This is a true saying, if the man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. A bishop then must be blameless. It behooves a bishop blameless to be. And what's the word blameless? Well, you'll see all this in the footnotes. The word means not able to lay hold of. Y'all ready to go home now? <laughs> this is rough. That means they can't go into your life and take hold of something and use it against you. That is absolutely brutal, especially if they're looking for something. And I've been there. I've been in a church trial where they held trial against me and my family and thought of everything they could to have me put out of the ministry so they could exonerate themselves. I've been there. Unable to lay hold of, and that's emphatic by position. So the emphasis is on his moral character. He must be the husband of one wife. Our men know what that means. The construction is anarthrous. He must be a one woman kind of man. The leading fundamentalist pastor in the United States had a mistress for 18 years. When he was faced with this, what did he say? I've always been the husband of one wife. That's not what it means. Look, look if you would, there, uh, footnote 4, 1 Timothy 3, 2. Mias gunakos andra, a one-woman kind of man. There are no definite articles there. It emphasizes character or quality. A man may be the husband of one wife and be immoral. But if it's evident, if he's a one-woman kind of man, you have a man of moral impeccability, and that's the requirement. <clears throat> and then, of good behavior. That's really important, of good behavior. What in the world does that mean? What's the Greek word there? Cosmion. What's cosmos? Cosmetics. Cosmetics, order, arrangement. He must be organized. How's that, Pastor Joe? That's a re he must be organized. You get a disorganized pastor that it's reflected in the whole church. It's reflected in his preaching. It's reflected in his sermon preparation. Uh, I have a lot of friends that I've had to talk about this to over the years. What are you doing? Well, we're preaching an exposition of Romans, of the book of the Epistle of the Romans. I said, ah, oh, it's my favorite book. Wow, what are you doing? They're giving a series of sermons on justification by faith and they never opened the text. <laughs> Disorganized. Takes too much discipline to open the text, I suppose. And it was, it was a disappointment for me because I invited them to a conference and I was ashamed when they preached their, uh, their survey on justification by faith from the book of Romans. But of good behavior here is really organized. He must be an organized man. And that is reflected in the pulpit ministry. And then given to hospitality, and finally, we're going to quit after that, apt to teach, didacticon, didactic, skilled in teaching. He must have a gift. And that's about the only thing it says about ministerial gifts, preaching gifts. He must be gifted in teaching. Uh, there was a man, he was a student, and when he spoke, and he was a Bible teacher in a student church, it always looked like he was chewing gum. He would be talk, talking like this. And, and I thought, what is he just swallowed that gum? Didn't have any gum. That's just one of his peculiarities. And so you always had to sort of close your eyes and look down at your Bible and not look at him because it was so distracting. Then there are people who have just strange mannerisms and so forth. And that takes away. When, when you're in the pulpit, you're communicating everything about you. Your looks, yes, your beard if you have one. Some of the old ladies will sit back there and shake their head. They won't receive. I had a man tell me, he said, I would never receive any, anything from a man with a beard. And I says, how do you get along with our Lord then? <laughs> and my dad was standing there. We were having to be in a, in a mall. 
uh, in San Jose. My dad was there with his gray beard, part patriarch, but clear down to here. He says, come on, Bill, let's go. <laughs> I miss him to this day. So when you look through all of this, what do you find? You find everything. And, and then, of course, you find a good report of them that are without, a person who's not lifted up with pride. Sometimes uh, young preachers, especially if they've had some success, they preached a sermon or two and and people say how great they are and how wonderful they are and they get lifted up and the first thing they do is fall on their face. The old story is told of the, of the young preacher who, who ran up the stairs to the pulpit and just preached and just fell up as a flop. And then he just with his head hung down, he went down the stairs of the pulpit and sat down and after the service the old preacher said, had you gone up to the pulpit the way you came down, it would have been a good message. <laughs> but not being lifted up with pride. And you know, if, if you rely on your humor, and some people do. Uh, coming out of fundamentalism, I have all the bad stories. But uh, they rely on their humor or a story or something else. And it bothers me because I've heard the other preachers tell the same story. How many stewardesses are one to Christ on planes? There's not that many stewardesses in the entire world, but they have to say that when they get to the Bible conference. And you say, man, I've heard that thing so many times. I'd like to know if it's valid or not. Maybe it was the first time or so. But they rely on things like that. If we rely on anything, let us go with a prayer that God will give us freedom to preach and let us at least be able with some skill to open the text. Get the attention of the people. There's a Bible school, I won't mention the name of it, and they put the sermons from the graduate students in this paper that they publish. It all starts out with a personal story. You had a question or we're out of time? Okay, fine. Uh, it all starts out with a personal story. And from there, once they have the people's attention, they go to the scriptures. And you think, and every sermon is like that because their homiletics professor taught them, first you get the people's attention by telling them a story, then you go to the scriptures. You may have to do that in an unruly Sunday school class. You may have to do that with little children to hopefully get their attention and get them settled down. But we need to open the text. And oftentimes, that's, that, that's the, the greatest part of the message. If, if, you, if you're able to open the text and show people something they haven't seen before, and, and they know enough to lay hold of it, if you have sort of a word equivocation there, uh, what about the, the, the stony ground hearers? By and by, because of the word, they are what? Offended? Offended. What's the Greek word? Scandalizo, they're scandalized. People can, can get a hold of that and say, wow, yeah, there it is, you see. And they've seen it. They've seen it in people's lives. They can, it, it's maybe not exactly that. A scandal on is something that trips up, but scandalizo, and that's where we do get our word scandalized. That, that'll preach. People say, yeah, scandalized. You know, and it'll stay in their minds. They've learned something. The word of God has opened up to them, and you have them in your thinking. All right. Oh, Titus, I'm not going to spend too much time with that. First, uh, Second Corinthians four, Colossians one, uh, striving according to his working, which worketh in me, whereunto I labor. The word labor there, koipo, it means exhausting toil, exhausting labor. Some people think, well, you know, the pastor only works two or three hours a week and, uh, you know, gets a sermon or like some preachers do, he buys a book, gives you 150 sermon outlines. I was in a pastor's study where he took his book and he told the secretary, write, uh, type out that outline, in the days of time, type out that outline for this Sunday. And he was going to get up and preach it. He'd get a few illustrations along the way and, wow, man, that's really good. That was a great outline. But it was apart from him. It wasn't part of his personality. It wasn't a man who has conviction and compassion and authority speaking to another person or to a congregation. It was just, there it was, you see. And uh, I had a pastor friend, he's an older man, and he told me once, I think it was my last year in school, he said, Bill, there are two types of preachers. Only two? <laughs> <laughs> 
He said, some you can listen to, others you have to listen to. And I'm thinking to myself, the man you have to listen to is the man who's probably called of God. Amen. There's that authority there. And a man may be young, and he might be preaching to older people, but if he has the, the, the anointing of God, the, the, the truth of God upon him, uh, it'll make an impression. Spurgeon was just, what, 16 when he started preaching? And he preached in this one church, and uh, the old preacher came up to him. You know what he said? My, but you're the sauciest dog that ever barked in a pulpit. <laughs> boy, but he recognized there was something about this boy preacher, as they called him. It was, just, it was awesome, and there was power. There was authority there. And so you're a man of God if you're only 16. God doesn't call boys preacher boys. Oh, my soul, I resent that to the nth degree. Preacher boy. I'm too old for that. They can't call me a preacher boy anymore. But, uh, you know, we have our preacher boys here, and they're all going to preach a sample sermon in this Bible conference. Oh. So that's what it is. It's uh, entertainment. It's, uh, it's a contest. We're going to give a new Bible for the boy that preaches the best sermon. What does that have to do with the Word of God? What does that have to do with being a man of God, of being a prophet, of coming with the Word of God to declare? Entirely different. We are going to spend just a little time, 2 Timothy chapter 4, page 3. And I'm sorry that some of these pages are upside down. I had to put a staple someplace in them. And my, my printer and I were having an argument last night. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. All of these are in the aorist imperative in the Greek. There are two imperatives in Greek. One is a present imperative, keep on doing something. The aorist imperative, do this with all determination and with a sense of urgency. Be instant in season, out of season. It means be there. Be there. Be there when it's convenient. Be there when it's not convenient. And if you're a pastor very long, you'll have to be there when it's not convenient. I've only been caned once by an old man, and he, he whacked me a time or two with his cane outside a radio station in the Midwest. I guess my evangelism was a little rough at that time. But he was a mean and gnarly old fellow. But sometimes it's not convenient. Sometimes you have to go into situations that are rough. And having said that, the man who's in the pulpit, and I've told our, our men this, I do not doubt that, good night, we have a theological faculty of four in our church. We have about six men or seven who preach here, rescue missions and so forth on a fairly regular basis. I don't doubt that any of these men or any man of our church could get up on a given occasion and preach a better message than I can. I don't doubt that. But I do doubt they could do it 9,000 times in a row. And I'm approaching the 9,000th message here in about another year. That's different. The man who stands in the pulpit is the man who's at their bedside. The man who's there when they have a death in the family. The one who's married members of the family. He's the one that knocks on the door when it's not convenient. He's the one they call in the middle of the night and he gets dressed and comes over to the house. In that context, the preaching means much. It has a power. There's authority, there's power, there's also a compassion and an understanding. And if you want some encouragement, brethren, the older you get, until you lose your mind, the older you get, the more advantage you have. You look old and gnarled and gray-haired, and that counts for something, at least in the ministry. It's rougher on young men because it, they'll sit there in the pew and say, what does he know? He hasn't been through all of this, so God's going to have to make you old and bald or gray-headed and gnarled and scarred and <laughs> stooped and hip replacement and cancer and a few other things and clots in your lungs and pneumonia and whatnot. And you're up there, <laughs> you've got a rattle and people have a sympathy <clears throat> for you. He's a real man. And, and they partake of that because it's your whole personality in the pulpit. Some people just preach at Bible conferences. They go from one conference to another 
We never get to know them. And sometimes it's very disappointing to really know them. But uh, I, uh, I heard one preacher, uh, he's well known, he's one of the top six or seven in the United States. I won't mention his name, but it's a good remark. He was at a meeting and I went to him and I said, I'm giving you regards from so-and-so, the girl that grew up in our church years and years ago, uh, married, uh, got married, grew up and had her family in his church and then moved to another state. He remembered her and remembered the family. Oh, I know. And you know, he could, I tell you, he was really tired. He said, I've, I've got to fly out tonight. He says, I've got prayer meeting tomorrow night and I've got to prepare for it. I thought, that's a good man. Stephen Lawson, I'll give you his name, Stephen Lawson. I heard him preach for two or three nights. I listened to him and I saw his passion and so forth. And I think he has a pastor's heart. But I know some that seem to lack. But the man in the pulpit, anybody can be in the pulpit and preach a tremendous message. Wow, that was just awesome. But if he's the man that's been in my front room praying with me, or I've been in his study praying with him, I've had problems with my children. He's gone down and prayed for them. When I come into church, he asks me, how, how is your son doing? Is he improving? If he's in the pulpit, we have a different relationship. That's the pastoral ministry preaching ministry. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, and they're, they're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, turn away their ears from the truth, be turned unto fables. What's the Greek word fables there? Traditions? Fairy tales? Mythos. Myths. I think that's the word that's used there in the Greek. I don't have it in my notes. But you, he said, but you... Timothy, and it's, it's singular, but you, nephe, nephe means uh, not to have your senses dulled by wine. What's he saying? But you, Timothy, keep on, this is, happens to be a present impair, but you, Timothy, it, it's a third, uh, third declension, a uh, third uh, conjugation. He said, but you keep on being clear headed. Be clear-headed. That's a hard thing to do in the ministry. There's problems in the church. You're the one who's got to get up and, 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 and pour out your heart in preaching. It's just not a matter of homiletics. It's a matter of, of, of being there and giving of your entire personality in a troublesome time. But you, Timothy, when all these people are not holding up under sound doctrine, he says, you keep on being clear-headed. And then he said, do the work of an evangelist, and it's urgently practice evangelism, aorist imperative, and then completely fill up your ministry. It's the emphatic uh, form of plerao, and, uh, which means to be full. Completely fill up your ministry. Don't leave big gaps and completely fill it up. All right. Now, I... I I'll let you read B.B. Warfield uh, on page four. This is, uh, this is a Warfieldism. Extremes meet. Pietists and rationalists have ever hunted in couples and dragged down their quarry together. They may differ as to why they deem theology mere lumber and would not have the prospective minister waste his time in acquiring it and so on and so forth, have to read that. You have to read that. And, and then, but if the minister, uh, paragraph two, is the mouthpiece of the Most High, <coughs> charged with a message to deliver, to expound and enforce, standing in the name of God before men, to make known to them who and what this God is, and what his purposes of grace are, and what is his will for his people, then the whole aspect of things is changed. No second-hand knowledge of the revelation of God for the salvation of a ruined world can suffice the needs of a ministry whose function it is to convey this revelation to men, commend it to their acceptance, and apply it in detail to their needs. That's a high view. And he's talking about the study of the original languages and so forth and of opening the scriptures. That's the first big paragraph. I didn't want to take all the time to read it. Now, J.C. Ryle. And he sent them to preach his comments. The importance of preaching as a means of grace might easily be gathered from this passage. 
It is but one instance among many of the high value which the Bible everywhere sets upon preaching. It is, in fact, God's chosen instrument for doing good to souls. By it, sinners are converted, inquirers led on, and saints built up. A preaching ministry is absolutely essential to the health and prosperity of a visible church. The pulpit is the place where the chief victories of the gospel have always been won, and no church has ever done much for the advancement of true religion in which the pulpit has been neglected. We know whether a minister would we know whether a minister is truly a, a, a truly apostolical man? If he is, he will give the best of his attention to his sermons. He will labor and pray to make his preaching effective. And he will tell his congregation that he looks to preaching for the chief results on souls. And I want to finish with uh, Bob Inc. That'll take us to page five. If a minister is not convinced of the divine truth of the word he preaches, his preaching loses all authority, influence, and power. If he is not able to bring a message from God, who then gives him the right to put himself on a pulpit a few feet above them? Who would dare? Who would be able to do this unless he has a word of God to proclaim? So it's not merely the mechanics of homiletics or preparing a sermon. The whole, the whole life uh, is involved in this. It's times, that's true, we get into the pulpit tired and we fail to even come close to what we know what could be. And most of the time we think, well, I don't know if I've ever really preached at all. If you've heard uh, Lloyd-Jones on tape, uh, he said, I believe I've only preached twice in my, my entire life and in both cases I was dreaming. <laughs> he, was, he was dreaming about preaching. And I dreamed, uh, oh my, I, was, I dreamed all last night. I, uh, I, I'm on medication as an old man so I can sleep. I've left off all medication now except my blood pressure medication. I've not got a good night's sleep in two weeks. I'm just utterly exhausted, but I'm going to get back to uh, leaving off these medications they give to old people because it, uh, I left off the statin drugs because they take away your short-term memory. And my cholesterol is fairly low, believe it or not. And I've left off the trazodone. That's a, that's a tranquilizer they give for insomnia to people after the age of 55 or 60. And since my cancer, I don't sleep well at night. Two or three hours sleep, good sleep most nights and so forth. And I'm trying to break all of that. So I went off everything. And uh, I'm tired. I'm exhausted but we're going to make it through. Amen. Now, if the man sleeps under my preaching, that's bad. If I sleep in the pulpit, that's a tragedy. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm trying because I have to be clear. My mind has to think, and I have to be productive in that way. So look at the, look at the chart, Practical Theology on page 5. It is fed by exegetical theology, biblical theology, historical theology, systematic theology, all of that feeds into what we call practical theology. It has its input. Exegetical theology is theology that derives from the very text of Scripture in the original language. The study of words, philology, the study of grammar and syntax, all of that feeds into theology. Then biblical theology Biblical theology traces the progressive development of divine revelation, preparatory in the Old Testament, finality in the New, and traces the progressive self-revelation of God and his redemptive purpose in the scriptures. We need to be grounded in biblical theology, and that has an immediate application to uh, homiletics. We can preach the gospel from an Old Testament text, but we better not stay in the Old Testament or end in the Old Testament because it always anticipates the finality of the new. There's some glorious studies in the Old Testament, but we always come to a gospel conclusion. And then historical theology. That begins with the close of the canon of Scripture at the end of the first century, and it comes right up now to what we have in the 21st century, creeds, confessions, confessions, 
uh, councils, controversies, and characters, to make them all begin with a C. And all of this, there's no doctrine we have that has not been debated, been preached by heretics, been answered by the orthodox, have been put down in very succinct statements and confessions of faith and so forth. Some of these doctrines have been battled over for centuries. It's a tremendous study, historical theology. The problem today is that Christians aren't interested in history. They're, they're future-oriented. They're, they're waiting for the Lord to come back. They're looking for, I don't know, the end of the world or something else. But history, history is foundational. And if we're not well studied in history, we're going to commit some of the same blunders that people have in the last. People in the past have, have just gone into all sorts of things. They've committed great blunders. Someone says, well, why, why, uh, why study Greek and Hebrew? Why, why try to, why to get, a, get a handle of the original language, which is something every man should do. I think it's absolutely necessary. I don't think it's a requirement for the ministry. I taught myself Greek and Hebrew enough to read it my first two years in the ministry, alone with two textbooks. Because I said, that's the way I have to go. I don't want a mere secondhand knowledge of the Word of God. Then I was able to go back to school and take two years of Greek in one semester. While the students were scratching their head and crying to the teacher, it was all coming together for me. Oh, I was having the time of my life. At a certain point, it just, you just reap the goodness from it. Well, uh, now my mind's completely blank. Historical theology. Oh, what, what, what's the good of this? The Jehovah's Witnesses go to John 1.1 1, 1, and they take the third independent clause and the word was with God and they translate it, the word was a God. How can they do that? There's a reason for it. And it's a principle that's true of almost all the cults. It's true of the Campbellites in Acts 2.38. Same thing is there. What is it? They apply the rules of English grammar to the original language. You can't do that. Kai theos ein ha lagos. Theos, God, does not have the definite article. Of course it doesn't. It is the predicate nominative. The word with the definite article in an, in an equitative statement, a 2B statement, we call them in English, the word with the definite article is the subject. So we say ha lagos and kai ha lagos and the word as to his essence, his deity. Amen. Theos, without the definite article. Anarthra stresses core character quality. Acts 2.38. They will diagram on the board, the Campbellites with and the Campbellite Baptist debates, you know, that, uh, that repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And they'll draw it, repent and be baptized, that these are equal verbs. But they're not in Greek. One is in the second person plural, the other one is in the third person singular, aorist. All of you urgently immediately be baptized and uh, repent and let every one of you be baptized. They're not equal by any stretch of the imagination. And that's consistent with the rest of the New Testament. But you'll find that the cults will try to apply the rules of English grammar to the language of the New Testament. And you'll sit there and say, blah, 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 blah. well, uh, I tell you, brother, Jesus was God, and that's good enough for me. And that's not the way you want to handle it. You want to learn. You want to educate yourself. You always want to learn. And every time you preach on a text, you want to open it up and discover the riches that are there. And uh, I don't say you should be an apologist all the time or a polemicist and fight everybody and have a, a, a polemical attitude. That, that means the Greek word for warlike. It means uh, differences within Christianity where we fight over believers' baptism or infant spring. That's polemics. But you open the text. You feed your people. I've had people come to me, happens occasionally, said, Pastor, I'll never see that text the same again. Thank you. Thank you for opening the word of God. I've heard preaching on this text for 20 years. I never heard anything like this today. Now they know what it says. Now they know what it means. They've opened it up and they, they have a grasp of it. They learn. 
Then systematic theology. All of these feed into systematic theology when we try to have a coherent, a non-contradictory uh, grasp of all divine truth according to the analogy of faith. It's non-contradictory. all fits together. That's the goal of systematic theology. All of this feeds into practical theology. We have the theory of the Christian ministry, ecclesiastics, liturgics, homiletics, poimenics, which is pastoral theology, apologetics, defense of the faith, evangelistics, and catechetics, teaching and so forth. All of these come forth. So homiletics is in practical theology, but it entails all of this that feeds, like a big funnel, all of this feeds into homiletics. So to say that homiletics is simply the preparation and delivery of sermons cuts it off from the pastoral ministry, cuts it off from its spiritual quality and character. It's much, much more than that. And of course, Broadus limited himself. Uh, E.C. Dargan was another professor here. He taught on what? What did E.C. Dargan teach on? Has a two volume set on it. No Southern Baptists among us? The history of preaching. And I tell you what, I have yet to read the book. We're going to have to write one on the history of preaching. My, they go to medieval Catholic mystics as great orators and everything else. I'm a little narrower than that. Uh, they, a lot of these heretical people in times past saying they were, they were great orators and in, in, well, they may have been influential ministers or preachers, but they didn't hold to the truth. So I sort of X them out of uh, my perpetuity line on the history of preaching. So there has to be a little more than that. But actually, they're great works, and it shows what we have in time past. And you will discern that most of the great men, most of the great men were great preachers. Great preachers. If, if a man is a writer, well and good. Uh, let him write. Uh, Spurgeon said he never wrote out his sermons because he did so much writing anyway that he didn't have to write out his sermons, but he had this photographic memory with all of this material here, and just God would give him the material. There's already, he was just ready to explode all the time, like he was trying to keep this out and this out. They, somebody uh, rebuked him for his humor in the pulpit. He said, if they only knew how much humor I have to keep out of the pulpit. His mind was sharp. He started, he was preaching in 1 Corinthians, Everyone hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, you know, that type of thing. He started out his sermon by saying this. Now, you have 7,000 people there. I know that they were laughing when he said this. He said, these ancient Plymouth brethren at Corinth. Wow. You know anything about the Plymouth brethren? The popes and corduroy, as they were called? They're all sitting there, and one hath a psalm, one hath a doctrine, and Everybody's a leader and they don't have any order and so forth. Four different groups, but especially in Britain, these were the Plymouth Brethren, had the immediate you know, working of the spirit and chaos in their assemblies. That is just such pointed humor and it drove the sword right to the hilt. So uh, there, there it is. So, but there's a place for humor in the pulpit. Our people here are not used to humor in the pulpit. You get a visitor once in a while and a visitor will laugh and then look around, nobody else is laughing, you know. But there's sometimes a play on words. We did discover something from the radical critics Sunday, did we not? They were true. Saul of Tarsus had a sunstroke on the road to Damascus. S-O-N. <coughs> yes, I said, yes, he had a sunstroke. S-O-N. But uh, the radical critics say he had a sunstroke and so... Mary Magdalene had a, some type of a vision and she was overcome emotionally and therefore we have the resurrection of the Lord and Saul of Tarsus had a sunstroke and lost his mind and, and left his Judaism so that explains the book of Acts. But he had a sunstroke, S-O-N. So we can make a point that way without perhaps losing the decor of the message. Mm -hmm. But there is a seriousness to preaching and, uh, and sometimes it can be humor if it's pointed if it drives home, and Spurgeon was the master of using humor, and it just drove the sword into the hilt. And I thought, I can't think of another way to say this that would have the effect that it had. But he never had humor for humor's sake. And, and oftentimes uh, in preaching, there's humor for humor's sake. And, and that, uh, I think it grieves the spirit of God.
and it, it makes uh, the whole meeting rather light. There are fellowship meetings. There's a time for humor. Uh, we certainly have our humor here at mealtime, besides some good fellowship when we're here. But the humor, the, the, the pulpit is really not the place for it. We have a message from God to deliver. And that's very serious business. And Spurgeon talks, uh, ooh, it will be, I think, maybe toward the last reading. I just went through and reread most of the three books this last week because I couldn't sleep well. But he speaks, he says, a person's salvation. Now, he's not talking as an Arminian, but he said a person's salvation might depend on the hymn that is chosen or the verse that is sung. And he, he talks about meetings where somebody, uh, they sang a certain hymn and this person was converted during that time. We believe that God is, is in that, you see. But he's, he's talking about this, taking care that everything is done decently and in order and that we're not sort of uh, have a, a laissez-faire attitude uh, toward the church service. There, there can be an informal meeting I like informal meetings. I like to sit here when everybody's sitting here after our noon meal and I'm just making observations on the book of Romans. I always go too long. Uh, we do that once a month. I get carried away, but I enjoy that. It enables me to deal with things I normally wouldn't deal with. There's a time. I like an informal meeting when brethren get together. Uh, we, were at a, we were at a church camp. This has got to be... This church is 21 years old now. This has to be 16, 17 years ago. We were at the camp on the coast, church camp. The people were sitting around. We're getting ready for supper. So we're going to have supper in about an hour and a half. They said, Pastor, why don't you preach? And one of the men who was there said, uh, could you give us something on definitive sanctification? And it was my son's father-in-law. And my son was sitting there. And so I pulled up my chair. Here I am, my old clothes. I've got my Dutch ovens there, getting ready to cook. And I sat back. And from my head, from memory, I opened up most of the Greek text of Romans chapter 6 and spoke on definitive sanctification in relationship to our union with Christ. You remember some of those that we gave on YouTube? And I did it completely extemporaneous. Mm -hmm. And a relative came up to me, put his arm around me, said, I've never heard anything like that in my life. I was aware of power. I could have walked on water. And all I had to say was, Lord, help me. And then I just started preaching. And it was, it was one of those great experiences. If that happened every time, well, I would believe an apostolic succession. <laughs> but it was one of those times when, when it was just, it was, I was amazed. I thought, I'm on a roll. I'd better, I'd better stay with us. Lord, help me. But it was, it was, to me, it was a glorious time. And the preachers who are here can tell you this. It might be glorious for other people, but sometimes it's agonizing for us. My pastor, you really had, pre you really had freedom this morning. Really? <laughs> you have no idea. I was agonizing. I was just trying to get a breath of fresh air. I was grasping for the surface. But they experienced it much differently than I did. So, and uh, he'll call this, uh, Lloyd-Jones, with the romance of preaching. But we just, we labor, we study, we pray for those times in which God gives us this freedom. Uh, like I say, the man who's going to give a talk at some club, he's not walking around the parking lot crying out to God for God to give him something or do something to his personality and uphold him. But the preacher is. The preacher is. The preacher's there praying and crying out and thinking, what am I doing here? Lord, unless you do something to me, I have nothing. The, gr the great thing is, on Sunday morning, I get up the way before daylight, I look at my notes, out comes the pen, and I'm redoing everything. You know what that means? It means we're still getting something done. Then I come over here and put it all on the computer, change everything around. That means it's still active. If I look at it and there's nothing there, it means it's dying. It's dying before it ever gives birth. It's, it's being aborted. I want it to be living when I get into the pulpit. I want it to do something to me. And we always go through this. And it's difficult. Difficult. And of course, we're, ex we're, we're extemporaneous preachers. We may have a slight outline. I have more notes. I write almost everything out now, at least in abbreviated form, three or four pages per sermon sometimes, just in case... 
my, in my old age, my mind slips a little bit, I'll be able to get back on track. But usually, I can put them down and sometimes never look at them again if I have freedom. You want that. You pray for it. And, and you have the message in your mind. Then it's, it's the entire personality, the entire life. Something will come up from 54, 55 years ago when God first converted me. It'll come out in my preaching. I haven't thought about it for 30 years, but it fits into the message. That means God is working in my personality and in my memory, and it's not simply preparing an outline and then getting up and preaching that outline. The, the whole man is involved. So all of this, all of this comes down to homiletics. And then I have homiletics, finally. Page six. And then we'll, we'll break for some discussion tonight, if that's okay. All right, homiletics. Homiletics comes from the Greek word homileo, which means to talk with, and homilia, a homily or a discourse. <coughs> so most of our theological terms come from the Greek. The major terms, the major structure of theology is still Greek. By 180 AD onward, and at least 220 AD, at the end of Tertullian's life, Tertullian was the first Latin church father, the, the, tra the, the transition came from Greek to Latin. So you have the Latin speaking West, Roman West, Roman Empire West, and the Greek speaking East, which would continue to create problems throughout the first seven centuries because they had two distinct vocabularies theologically. Homoousian and homoousian split the Roman Empire and uh, the so-called Western and Eastern churches. Homoousian of the same substance. Homoousian of like substance. The Arian controversy supposedly settled at the Council of Nicaea. It wasn't until really the Council of uh, Constantinople in 381. It wasn't really settled there. And the last good council was probably the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. Just finished a book on that. Uh, very interesting. A lot of it was vocabulary. They started out without a theological vocabulary. They had to define it. And one writer said very perceptively, it wasn't arguing about what the Bible taught. They had to establish what the words of the Bible meant because they couldn't agree on that. Well, our, our, our doctrine derives from the Bible and from especially the New Testament, and they were trying to develop. And of course, we had Arianism. Were there, in, were there any real heresies at that time? There were extremes. You have to have dogma before you have heresy. Mm -hmm. Theologically. <clears throat> Not historically, because you have these varied opinions Paul talked about, and the Greek word is heresy. But unless there's dogma, dogma is the settled teaching of a church or religious group that is established in a confession of faith. In other words, these words mean this, that's it. If you depart from this, that's heresy. But they were developing this theological vocabulary. They were fighting over words and terms. Each side was giving different meaning to these terms. And it took at least three to four centuries for these to begin to settle down. And once the Trinitarian controversies were over, the Christological controversies began. Basically, the, the fourth through the seventh centuries on the person of Christ and the relationship of his human nature to his divine nature. And everything associated with this and all sorts of things, they were fighting over this. We have a theology handed to us. That's a tremendous advantage. Yes. Don't discount theology. Don't say, that's just an old dry theology book. A lot of blood that bound that book together. Right. Controversies. Uh, if you're interested in, the, in historical theology, Read William Cunningham's two volumes. Read the two volumes by the German fellow, whose name I forget uh, at this point, and they make it live. And you see that all of this had to be fought out, discussed. Now it's handed to us. All of this comes out in homiletics. But we have a generation that may not be well taught. 
So how much technical language do we use in our sermons? Almost everybody in our church has at least a Greek interlinear on his or her lap. That's the type of church we have. Taken us a few years to get there. Most of them have had at least a year of Greek. Some of them carry the Hebrew Old Testaments, not the interlinears either, but the Masoretic text. And, uh, and they're always making notes, looking things up and so forth. But, and we do use big words. And if it's a word and we have visitors here, I will try to explain that word or <coughs> analyze that word. How can you explain regeneration? And with that, uh, I'm going to take about one minute break and uh, then, we will, uh, then we'll have some discussion tonight, okay?